What are we missing? What letter are we missing in blue? E. That's not great, but that one makes a lot more sense to me than, than B for Spartan. So uh, that is the one letter code for glutamate, glue. Um, the amides are not ever going to be charged. They're not going to pick up the proton or donate the proton in the way. Um, they are just the amide derivative of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So we have asparagine, and this is our amide here. And we have glutamines, and again, the amide. And these amides are polar. They interact just fine with water, never charged. So these don't act as an acid or base under, uh, let's say, general biological conditions. If you get a proton on there or off of there, um, maybe, but not at sort of biological pHs. So these interact just fine with water. Asparagine, we can't use the same three letter code that we use for aspartic acid, but um, so instead of P, we'll have an ASN for asparagine. And the letter we changed was P to an N, so that one letter code is N. Really pushing that A minus N. And the glutamine is going to be exactly the same. It'll be GL and And at this point, you're running out of letters in the alphabet to use. And so Q is the letter that you can use. Okay. So we're good with those. The acidic amino acids, that's aspartic acid and mechanic acid. And then the amide derivatives are the asparagine and the glutamine. Glutamine, I mentioned a little while ago, is used as a nitrogen carrier in our bloodstream. Right, to, to move nitrogen to um, kidneys. Or whatever or other. So there's a way to get nitrogen moved out of muscle in particular, but not just muscle. There are other ways to move nitrogen as well, but glutamic acid. It's changed the glutamine before it's dumped into the bloodstream. Okay. Moving on to basic. The basic amino acids are considered these two, even though there is a third one, and we'll talk about the third one, it kind of fits into its own category. Um, these are pretty strong bases. And at pH 7, these amino carrying groups are positively charged. With lysine, we have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. And the way I remember how many carbons, it's the epsilon carbon that has this primary amine for lysine. So epsilon carbon has this nitrogen pKa of the side groups on the order of 10 and a half. So you have to get up to pH 9 and a half before you start to pull this proton off. At 10 and a half, half of the proton will be on, half will be off at any one time. You get to 11 and a half, it's pretty much that's off. 
arginine, arginine has this guanido group. So this is a guanido group. It has a pK on the order of 12 and a half. So it's even more basic than lysine. It's going to be charged under just about all biological conditions. In fact, lysine and arginine carry these positive charges a little bit for offsetting, say, the polyphosphate of DNA with the all those negatively charged phosphates, boom, 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 boom. They will wrap around um, protein histones that have a lot of lysines and arginines to offset the negative charge of the phosphate. Okay, so at pH 7, definitely a jack the proton on these two groups. And are they usually on the outside? Usually on the outside of the protein. Depends. Sometimes there's something interesting going on on the inside. Three letter code for lysine. Yay. Follows the name exactly. But we can use L, that's used for leucine. So the lysine. Um, can't use L, but you know what's right in front of L. Okay. So the lysine is a K. For arginine, the three letter code follows, which is friendly. We can't use A, that's used for alanine, so instead they went kinetic here. Or pardon me. Um uh, arginine, so if you want to pretend you're a pilot, go for it. Um, so, here we go. Anything else to say here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that wrong? And I know some of you have been learning these um, before. We're talking about them now in lecture, which is great. The third amino acid that acts as a base is histidine. And, but its pKa is quite a bit lower than the other two. So with histidine, we have an aminosyl ring. And this pH here would be the predominant form of pH 7. And the reason for that is the aminosol is protonated below pH 6. At pH 6, it's going to be about half on and half off. pH 7 is just about all gone. So this would be the predominant form at pH 7. At pH 5, This is all ring. <coughs> would pick up the proton on this second nitrogen, and so that is carrying a positive charge. And so pH 5 and below, and it's really below 6, predominant form of the charge. Now, if you bury this inside a protein microenvironment and it's not surrounded by water, the pKa um, doesn't completely lose meaning, but it does change because pKa is a function of being in water. And when you start burying this in a microenvironment in a protein and you don't allow it access to water, um, it changes the pKa. This, this, how easily does a proton come on or off? And the fact that it comes on and off around neutral pH 
allows for this histidine way to participate in a bunch of catalytic mechanisms. And we'll see at least one of those as we go forward and look at catalytic mechanisms a bit later. Histidine, the three letter code follows J, and the one letter is also H. All right. So histidine is a little different, but good for good for enzyme activity. Okay. That brings us to the alcohols, and we did talk about one of the alcohols last time. Seems like a long time ago, last Thursday. Um, the alcohol phenylalanine and tyrosine. These are the smaller of the two alcohols, or two of the three alcohols. These are smaller. We have serine, which is just the alcohol of alanine. CH2. Oh, wait. This is one of those amino acids that if you've learned alanine, serine should not be very challenging. Just the alcohol of alanine. Three letter code is SCR, one letter code is S. So serine shouldn't be too tough. Polar, yes, they are. They interact just fine with water, yes. Just like methanol, ethanol. And threonine interacts pretty well with water as well. Good thing. CH2, CH2. It'd be good if I'm not looking at the wrong thing. It's about 50 yards. <laughs> like, wait a second. Where's my branch? It isn't quite like isoleucine, but it does have an alcohol here on, on, the, on the beta carbon, and then there's a CH3 after. This is a chirocarbon, so the stereochemistry matter. Okay, anything and everything that would bind it as an enzyme, yes, it matters. Um, in drawing the structure on an exam, no. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to tell me which one is the um, which one would be L. I don't care about this kind of function. I do, but it's okay. We, we've got enough to work on. Okay. And this is not a very big hydrocarbon here, so this is acting a lot like an ethanol. It does interact with water. Again, polar. Three letter code follows exactly, and the one letter code follows. That's not too bad. So really what you're doing is just putting a methyl group on serine. If you want to look at it that way. Okay, good so far? That will get a little bit different. Let's look at system. So cysteine structurally is going to be pretty darn similar to serine. <clears throat> it has the single methyl group, but it is modified with a sulfur rather than an oxygen. This is cysteine. Cysteine is polar. You might ask, why? Why is it that? Um, 
Um, sulfur is more electronegative than hydrogen. But it's about the same electronegativity as carbon. Um, why does sulfur have sulfur hydrogen be polar, OH be polar, but CH is not? Don't ask the hard question. Um, three letter code says one letter code is C, that's the easy part. The really interesting part here is that this is reactive. In fact, this has a pKa on the order of about 8. I don't think I have that written down here, but the pKa is on the order of about 8. The hydrogen is, should be on there at pH 7. But the fact that this is fairly acidic, that the proton can be removed, makes this a little more reactive than some other groups that we have. Right? This is a reactive this is a reactive pile or sulfur. And so we can do all kinds of reactions. Including disulfide bridges, which we'll see maybe today if not definitely by Thursday. And I think tomorrow and Wednesday is next. Uh, one. Uh, what about this? Glue? Uh, Sorry. Kiss yeah. Yes. Um, so, we're seeing that there. Why was the, I thought the double bond that's connected to the nitrogen would get disrupted first before the one. So, oh, okay. Oh. This one, I left out a double bond. Uh oh. That one is not disrupted. This one is not lost. This nitrogen has four bonds and it picks up the protons, so. I didn't, I didn't think it would be disrupted, but you did, I, I saw you did drive, so I thought it was like lost, but. I messed up. No, perfect. <laughs> Not a very complicated structure. I shouldn't have. Uh, Shouldn't have lost that double bond between those two carbons. It would not be disrupted. It is an aromatic ring. It stays an aromatic ring. Okay. So we're going to see some reactivity of cysteine as we move forward. The distinction in saying that this is polar when the proton is on here and that it interacts just fine with water. Um, it is worth the distinction because methionine has a carbon on either side of the sulfur. This is non-polar. Sulfur and carbon have the same electronegativity. And that means that methionine, this is last amino acid here, is considered a hydrophobic amino acid. It is generally buried inside a protein, usually, because it does not interact well with water. It is also not very reactive. So it is, it, it, you can take this methyl group off. You can do some interesting chemistry, but it requires quite a bit of energy input to make that happen. We won't be talking about that particular reaction. Cool. There are a few reasons you need cobalt, but we won't be talking about using methionine as a methyl donor today any more than we have. Um, Three-letter code follows the name and so there's the one-letter code. So the three-letter and one-letter codes on this page are pretty friendly. So if you know the name, you should know the three-letter and one-letter codes. Okay.
good? Yes. Jump into peptides. We'll talk about peptides a little here. We've got two pages worth, and then we'll talk about electrophoresis. We'll finish up electrophoresis on Thursday and talk more about protein structure, peptide structure. So, protein biosynthesis of the ribosomes includes energy dependent formation of peptide bonds. Now, you can make peptide bonds through these. Peptide bonds are sometimes made without using ribosomes, but the ribosomes are the machines that are going to read messenger RNA and synthesize protein. These are going to be very specific amide bonds where the alpha carboxyl group of one amino acid is bound to the alpha amino group of another. Let's take a look at that one. So what we've got here is one amino acid here on the left, carboxylic acid that are C alpha. We're going to be doing a lot of, okay, where is C alpha? Here's our carbonyl, there's our alpha amino group. Same with this amino acid, we're just saying it's any old two amino acids. And in this case, the alpha amino group is going to attack the carbonyl carbon. The carbonyl carbon has partial positive charge. It is electrons from the nitrogen that are doing this attacking. That's why it's attacking the carbon of the carbonyl, while the oxygens have partial negative charge. These elect this extra electron is being shared in this group and it's being shared by the oxygens a lot more than it is with the carbon. So these two oxygens are considered to have partial negative charge. This carbon has partial positive. Boom. So this is going to be nucleophilic acyl substitution. Our nitrogen is our nucleophile. It's usually going to do the attack with the proton off, but gets rid of the proton, has a pair of unshared electrons that can attack. And when we do this, we're going to make this dipeptide that we'll show here. CHR1, carbonyl, but now it is going to be an amide. You would have this dipeptide. This results in the loss of an oxygen and protons, so we're going to have a loss of water. We didn't add it in here yet, so we can add it into our balanced equation, we did lose a water. Our peptide bond is this guy. It's easy to find in your reading which one is peptide bond. You want to get familiar with the peptide bond. In fact, you would like to be able to run along the polypeptide backbone and go, okay, nitrogen, C alpha, here's the carbonyl, and nitrogen, aha, peptide bond. And then our next C alpha, carbonyl, and so on. Those are just the simple kind of peptide. You want to start being able to pick out the peptide bond and the C alphas. That helps a lot to figure out where you are in a protein. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yes, sorry, the nitrogen will be, lose its proton. That proton gets lost. It is these unshared pair of electrons that are doing the attacking. The proton is going to be taken by a basic group in the enzyme itself. So this is probably going to come in and it will be charged because the pK is so high, but there will be a basic group in there that will say, okay, I'll take that proton temporarily, and that will allow your electrons to attack them. This is something, this nucleophilic acyl substitution is something to look at um, in your organic chem text, in Leninger, in the self-study guide that I have for organic chem, I do show this one mechanism, nucleophilic acyl substitution, because we see it um, occurring again and again with carbonyl carbon, and whether it's the acid or an ester, a bioester, or an amyl, and so on down the road. There's a bunch of these carbonyl carbon compounds that are susceptible to attack by nucleophiles. And the nucleophiles are usually going to be helped out at the enzyme active site so that it becomes a better nucleophile. I can't remember the name of it, but the Khan Academy. Khan Academy does a decent job of showing the nucleophilic acyl substitution. So if, if you either want to just get brushed up on it or you haven't seen it before, that would not be a bad place to spend a little time at the Khan Academy for the nucleophilic acyl substitution. Because they'll move the electrons, tell you what's happening. So this synthesis here of the peptide bond, thermodynamically, it's unfavorable. It's going to cost energy. This forward reaction requires energy input. And when it's being synthesized in a cell, um, chemical energy is being spent. To make it happen. The reverse is thermodynamically favorable and it can happen just fine outside of the cell. Okay, so hydrolysis of the amide linkage releases energy, just the opposite. And this hydrolysis, um, well, releases energy, and that means that this can occur outside cell. And there are a lot of times that we're using the reverse reaction outside of cell. And digestion of food is one of them. It's not the only one. We have other places where we will break down proteins. Okay. Um, Hydrolysis occurs when water is consumed to break a single bond. So it's not hydration, which is adding water to a double bond. It is added to where there's a single bond, it will break the single bond. So hydrolysis, you are separating two parts, you're breaking that single bond. And we do, we, we carry out hydrolysis in a bunch of different, um, especially kind of, again, carbonyl compounds, kind of with lipids. And a little on carbohydrates. Not so much in nucleic acids. That's, that's, we do hydrolysis, but that's a 
phosphodiester sort of thought that we were going to break at least one of those phosphodiester bonds. So polypeptides are going to be a polymer of amino acids and are linked to one another by these peptide bonds. There are not precise limits on the sizes. I'm not going to ask you to tell me the between a peptide and a legal peptide. But peptides tend to be small, so on the order of less than 12, weight A for amino acids. Oligo peptides will usually in going from about 12 amino acids to about 20. A term that is just probably not all that useful, except it keeps kind of popping up. It's definitely out there. So you see peptide or oligo peptide. We're not talking proteins. They're smaller than proteins. Polypeptides greater than 20 amino acids. Still not a protein. Proteins are going to be polypeptides that consist of greater than 50 amino acids. Again, fuzzy. So I'm not going to be asking the distinction of these four on an exam. So I'm not sure that it's worth our time to memorize that. Protein complexes contain two or more proteins. They're associated in a group. It can be as small as two, okay. That's considered a complex. And complexes can be much, uh, lots of proteins. We used to work on a complex, had a couple dozen of them. Cool, cool, cool complex. Um, the polypeptide chain does repeat this structure. And that structure is going to end up being if we look here, we have the side group. The side group's always associated with C alpha. Then we have the carbonyl, the amide, so this is our peptide bond. And then we come up and we have our next C alpha, carbonyl, forming this peptide bond. The next C alpha, peptide bond, C alpha, and so on. Being able to identify the C alpha is useful. And a lot of times this side group is going to stick out away from the polypeptide backbone. Pretty much does. There are times when we can wrap it a little tighter, but we'll see that in a week or two. Okay. The peptide that is shown here is considered to be in the trans configuration. And the reason for that is that the carbonyl with this peptide bond, peptide bond has partial double bond character. So we'll talk about that on the next page. And it turns out that carbonyl oxygen is always on the opposite side of the amide hydrogen. So it's the this part of the molecule that is trans configuration, that is the peptide bond, carbonyl oxygen on one side, amide hydrogen on the other. So if you think of a double bond for carbon, carbon, carbon double bond, you have either cis or trans trans and as far apart as it can get. And that happens to be the case with the polypeptide backbone. Carbonyl oxygen is almost always trans to the amide hydrogen. 
and it's often shown in a diagram as being in trans configuration. If I ask you to draw a peptide with a trans configuration, it's these two atoms on either side of the peptide bond that are dictating the trans configuration. Okay? I know it seems like that's easy now, but I have asked for a simple drawing of a small peptide on many exams. Every exam, I'm not sure if it's been on the exam. Most of the exam, yeah, most of the exam. And that is always something I said, trans configuration. There's always a couple students who say, I don't know what that means. You guys, you know what it means. But let's look at this a little carefully. Um, there was a lot of structure of molecules uh, going on in the first half of the 20th century. And in fact, in the 1930s, um, X ray crystallography was pretty in vogue. And it was starting to be used to study the amino acids and short peptides. And it was found that the peptide unit, which we'll define here in a moment, is rigid and planar. The peptide bond could not rotate, so, like a double bond, could not rotate. And in fact, that this carbon nitrogen peptide bond did have partial double bond characteristics. Before we list all those characteristics, the person carrying out these studies was Linus Pauling. Of course, Robert Short. So Linus Pauling was starting to utilize techniques like x-ray crystallography and applying them to biological molecules, trying to figure out structure. And then the more that was learned about these short peptides told us a lot about what might be going on in protein. And a lot of that turned out to be sort of true. Um, these guys measured the following. They might measure the average peptide bond. And the average peptide bond um, was 1.32 angstrom. And it's written there, these measurements. And this is our peptide bond. This is our oxygen. This is our carbonyl, a nitrogen, and a hydrogen. So this is our peptide bond. But your average carbon-nitrogen single bond, 1.49 angstrom. The peptide bond's a lot shorter. Double bonds are shorter. Your average carbon nitrogen double bond is 1.27 angstrom. So, just based on distance, the peptide bond is closer to a double bond than a single bond. There's also a trans configuration, but the geometry of these atoms is planar, in fact, also out to the C alpha. So the peptide plane here actually contains six atoms. The C alpha is on either side are lying in this same plane, flat plane. So like, again, if this carbon-nitrogen were a double bond, that's exactly what you'd expect. So the geometry is much closer to a double bond than a single bond. And this image over here on the right does show all six atoms in the plane. 
from six atoms in the peptide plane. So that's one reason I like to show that diagram. We'll see more of this later. These arrows here are referring to the rotation about C alpha. So C alpha, there's free rotation, but the atom itself is sitting in this plane. Same with the next C alpha, there's going to be free rotation on the single bonds of the C alpha, but there are not with the peptide bond nitrogen, this amide nitrogen, and one of the amide carbonyl. And they also found that this hydrogen for the amide is always trans for the oxygen, just about. There is one exception, proline. Proline just won't. Proline doesn't, proline doesn't play like the others. But that can end up being pretty useful. Some of them. It could be in the wrong place and then less than useful perhaps. Questions about this? Yeah. So when you're describing partial uh, triple bond characteristics, isn't that the minority of instances of this molecule is going to have a double bond with the nitrogen and it's going to lack the oxygen? And then the uh, double bond of oxygen is going to stop the alcohol? Or is it that it's going to have, so the oxygen is always going to be double bonded, but it's going to have double bonded characteristics where it's uh, closer to the carbon and will never double bond to the nitrogen? That would be correct. The second, the double bonded oxygen, however, is behaving like there was a double bond with the nitrogen and the carbonyl carbon, but there's not. So we don't have carbon with five bonds. We don't have pentavalent carbon. But this thing is not, um, I guess it maybe it doesn't fit in. Um, the classification of, of a typical sort of, okay, it's got to be this or that. Um, yeah. Um, what causes those uh, kind of double bond characteristics then? What's that? What, are, what causes those, uh, um, some of those characteristics of a double bond without it being a double bond? Um, in terms of and by characteristics, right, it's short, like a double bond. It's flat, like you would expect the double bond carbon to have, or even if this was a double bond, but you would expect this then to be a flat plane. So it's behaving like, but this is not a full-fledged double bond. So there is some electron sharing that's going on. Um, how much is there is um, not a bad question, but it's, it is not a true double bond between the nitrogen and the carbon. So it is doing some sharing, but we, we would not say that the carbon has the equivalent of five bonds. What's that? Is it because they won't count the nitrogen uh, as a lesbian structure of the carbon? And that's why sometimes there is a double bond. Yes, we could draw different structures. You can say that they're sharing, you can say that they're in resonance. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how else to answer it. I apologize if that doesn't sound very satisfying. Um, we'll go with this is how it is. Um, but it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. We'll, we'll, well, when we get into Cabot's mechanism, we're actually going to see what happens if you want to try to reverse and bring in a bond. What's happening with our bonding? So um, that may not still be any more satisfying. Okay. With that said, we will get to more of this later about, okay, where can we actually rotate and where can't we? Well, we cannot rotate around the peptide bond. Okay. So, peptide bond could not rotate. And that distinction here is that the bond here of C alpha can. Okay, with that, the first level of complexity of protein structure is going to end up being just the primary amino acid sequence. Which amino acid comes after which amino acid? So that is the primary structure. And we've got an example shown here bradykinin, plasma peptide of ours, has nine amino acids. Um, and those amino acids are shown right here. Typically, we would draw these with the N terminus on the left hand side, C terminus on the right hand side. However, you could draw this just about any direction, three dimensional space. Um, it, it, but, Frequently, you'll see it drawn like this, but as soon as you are going to show it bound to a protein, for example, then the question is, okay, how how is the protein situated in space? How are we going to fit this space filling model of our peptide into that protein that it binds? Um, so, even though it might be drawn like it's this, you may have to flip this guy around to get it to fit into a protein. Get the protein around both. And then this follows our polypeptide backbone, and we can show this would be our first peptide bond here. Making this our C alpha. Boom, here. Wow. Yeah, because <laughs> this is a ring. This would be C alpha. This one's a little tougher because we've got some polines in here. Um, what's the first amino acid side chain for? Arginine. And then we have this guy who's going to change the structure somewhat. This is a proline where the peptide nitrogen is tied up in the amino acid side chain. What's the next amino acid? Also a proline. So we have NH. Here's our C alpha. What C alpha is this one? Any side chain? There's no side chain at all, it must be hydrogen. That one would be glycine. This next one, E, so phenylalanine, and so forth. And so you can go along and fill out and read this. Um, do you want to be able to read this kind of a structure? I think it is useful especially to go through and find the peptide bond and then find where C alpha would be. Which is not always, I mean it takes a little getting used to. Whether it's drawn like this or as it was written out on the previous page. You're not going to be given anything like this and said, okay, what's the sequence of this space filling bond? Um, space filling models are great. They are more challenging to try to figure out 
this kind of information is present. So, okay. Moving on, you guys ready to shift to electrophoresis? We'll shift to electrophoresis, and then next week we're going to go back to peptide structure, protein structure. But the electrophoresis is pretty useful because it gets used a lot. routinely in laboratories and there you go. it gets used for both DNA RNA, nucleic acids, and also for protein. So anyone who works in laboratories may very well be doing some electric research at some point. I know some of you have have done that. Electric is going to separate molecules based on charge and solid. And typically on sides, because it's got to get through some kind of a matrix, because a charged field, this, this molecule is in a charged field, and that electric field is going to be pulling the protein or nucleic acid to one side or the other. And then it has to get through whatever challenging matrix you put it up against. We'll talk about the matrix. So as long as a molecule has a net charge, it will feel a force when placed in an electric field. And the movement of that molecule, the mobility, varies inversely with some frictional coefficient. So the mobility is equal to the electric field times your net charge divided by whatever the frictional coefficient might be. And that friction depends on not only how big is the protein or nucleic acid, what is its shape, but also the viscosity of the medium or matrix. And this is can be all kinds of things, from paper to gels, almost never paper anymore. But 70, 80 years ago, um, paper was pretty common as a viscous medium to kind of slow things down. So what happens to this mobility if we increase the friction. If friction gets bigger, mobility is going to go down, right? So V goes down as F goes up. And we can increase the friction by making our medium more concentrated, more dense. Or more dense. If it is a mesh or and the more dense you make it, the harder it is to get through. What would happen to our movement if we actually increase the voltage or increase our electric field? Yeah. So if V goes up, E goes up, the mobility goes up. And that's frequently done, that's an easy thing to do, right? Because we're going to be using electric field, and typically we have a lot of control over that in the laboratory, and we can crank up the electric field. And as long as you don't melt your apparatus, or break it. One of my former mentors was well known for turning up his protein gel because he was a very impatient man. And he would he would turn it up because he wanted to finish in a hurry. And sometimes those glass plates would just crack. Get a little too warm. 
We can increase voltage by adjusting our power supply. We'll be setting these up with power supply. Do it all the time, crank it up. And then what if you increase or maybe decrease the charge Z, right? Charge of Z on the biomolecule. If we increase the charge, right? If we increase Z, we will increase the mobility or the V, the velocity at which the molecule can move. And we can change the charge on proteins by adjusting pH. Or we can change the charge by adding other molecules. SDS we'll talk about either today or next time. We don't usually adjust the net charge on DNA or RNA. Um, the net charge on DNA and RNA is negative, and that is from the phosphodiester linkage where every phosphate is carrying a negative charge. And this last oxygen, this charge, the pKa is on the order of 12. 12? No. The pKa is on the order of 2 for this OH. So this is always, almost always charged when you're doing electrophoresis for DNA or RNA. The phosphate is almost always charged. So you've got a lot of negative charge on DNA or RNA. That is not necessarily the case for protein. And it's much easier to control on proteins. Okay. Just briefly, the electrophoretic medium of matrix, although it did used to be paper, so you're going to be hard pressed to find anybody trying to do that now. And so the most popular are using a matrix that's made of carbohydrate chains, Avros, polyacrylamide, um, and these are easy to form, and we can make these matrices really dense, which is good for little things we want to move through, maybe not so much the big things, or you can make them very not so dense, so the big things can be separated. What the matrix does is it slows the fusion and slows the movement of the larger molecules, which can produce better separation. And pretty much it's by trial and error you figure out, okay, this is the kind of the window that I'm interested in in terms of sizes, so I'm going to make my matrix like this to separate this these sizes. If I need to separate bigger things, then I would use less of the matrix. If I need to separate little things, I would use more. Now, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is by far the most popular for proteins. This is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. It is also used for small, shorter pieces of nucleic acid, um, whether it's DNA or RNA. And the way this works with polyacrylamide is that it's going to be, you're going to set up a, a sorry, free radical polymerization. And we have acrylamide, which will form the linear building block. Bisacrylamide is for crosslinks. And we have linear polymer shown here. And every once in a while, you'll have a bisacrylamide thrown in that will hold together two linear segments. And the more crosslinker you want, the more crosslinker you can put in. 
Can you put in too much? It's not that hard. I did that experiment many years ago. Uh, I don't know why I got the ratio wrong. Put in the right amount of acrylamide, but I put in four times too much. This acrylamide and my proteins couldn't grow. There's just too much processing. But you determine how much you need for your situation. And very often, people have worked out the details and they'll tell you right off the bat, okay, this is how much acrylamide, this is how much this that we're using, and we will form our own gel. Or you may just buy a gel that's been pre-made happily so they can sell it to you at 10 or 12 dollars per gel, um, maybe even more than that, 15. And they're also going to tell you exactly what the percentages are. Because it does matter how tightly this thing is cross-linked so that you know whether or not your proteins that you like are going to be able to separate. And so what you'll do is you'll form the gel, whether it's going to be polyacrylamide gels, agarose gels, and then you're going to load your protein or DNA on one end, and then you're going to apply the electric field, and your protein or DNA is going to move. And in the most electrophoresis, the smaller move through the fastest, the larger are moving slower because of their getting through the matrix. And if they can't get through the matrix at all, right, you have something that's very big, it gets stuck at the top. And usually that gets ignored. But you keep an eye on such things because maybe you'll want to analyze that at some point. Maybe. We will see a type of electrophoresis where we're not going to separate by size. Um, we'll see that. That is, it, it requires some some special conditions, but they're not that hard to do. Um, in fact. Running out of time. I think I have nothing but time, but then I don't. Okay. I'm going to take this last three minutes and talk just a little bit right here at the top about a DNA gel, and then we're going to spend most of our time talking about protein gel. So, DNA, RNA, Agarose is the most common kind of gel, especially run in laboratories. These are going to be run under the main conditions. All molecules are going to have the same charge to mass ratio because every one of these DNA or RNA are going to have these negatively charged phosphates that run along it, whether you're looking at single stranded or double stranded. DNA or RNA. Why? Um, phospho diester backbone. Backbone. Covalent bonds that hold DNA and RNA together. And again, whether single strand or double strand. And so you have this consistent negative charge that runs the entire length. The nucleic acids are separated very nicely by size. The smallest are going to move through the agarose the fastest. The largest are the slowest. This is a ladder that's shown here where you have 2,000 bases um, here and 25,000 at the top. And this is double stranded. DNA, and you actually have a nice separation here, and that is in part decided by 
the 0.7% on us, how much medium do we have, and then the buckling system as to how nicely these things are separated. And then you can visualize it later, right? Visualize it a fluorescent eye, for example. And nice thing about this is that DNA that's 25,000, unless it's wrapped up in some funny way, um, if it's staying, for example, linearized, it's going to always run the same as any other 25,000 base pair piece of double stranded DNA, as long as it's not super wound up on some um, super coil, that sort of thing. So we'll just say this is all relaxed DNA, or perhaps linear. So DNA, easy. Proteins, it's not quite as simple, but turns out to be really useful when it's not quite so simple. And so we'll talk about on Thursday protein electrophoresis, and then we'll move probably on to the next topic.